travel and things in association with sun destinations, iconic destinations with amazing experiences present in conversation with. I am your host, David Batsafin, and today, once again, I am so glad to be joined by Sibusisu Volani, who was the first, dare I say it, black South African to summit um, Everest, and that was 20 years ago. Sibu, welcome back. I know that you've just returned or recently returned from Everest. I'm so glad you're home safe. Well, thank you very, very much indeed, Dave. Thank you for having me. Yes, um, I'm back at home. Uh, in fact, uh, straight from Everest, I went and led a group up Kilimanjaro last week. So I just <laughs> got back from that one. So, but yeah, Everest was uh, quite remarkable. Thank you for having me. Thank you for Talk having me. Talk to me about this particular image. Was this from that first attempt? The, yes, that is that is a picture taken to, on the 26th of May, 2003. And that picture has not been shown by many people because it, it was my picture that I had taken on my mm. little camera when I, when I was standing there. So standing next to me is David Hamilton, who then took that iconic photo of me with Robert Anderson at the top. Right. So yes, that, that picture was taken 20 years ago. Now, take us back. When, we, when you and I last spoke, um, you were hoping to raise enough money to take your family back to Everest, not to summit on this particular occasion, but to go to base camp with your entire family. That didn't happen, if I remember correctly. But you returned. What was it like going back, A, by yourself, and B, looking at the mountain from base camp going, been there, done that? Yeah, it was it was phenomenal, David. But yes, I'm, I was very disappointed. But my family couldn't join me. Uh, but we we understood uh, the circumstances behind that because it was we lacked the financial muscle to mm. fund all of us going, all six of us who wanted to go, myself, my wife, and my four children. But I still decided that even though they were not going to go with me, I wasn't going to miss the opportunity just to track back and trace my own foot steps back up mm. to the bottom of the highest mountain in the world. And I was then joined by people who, when I looked at it, I said, well, these were my chosen ones, my family to be with. Um, two wonderful ladies from South Africa and a couple from the UK. So five of us joined. And then with our three support crew from Nepal, it was just a very historic journey. And it was not different at all for me from when I first went. But there were some things that I would look at and say, I remember vividly when I was here, because one of those that I would like to share was, you climb up from a, this little village or high altitude town called Namche Bazaar to a, a little hotel, I think it's called the Everest View Hotel, where you can have a glimpse of Everest, Lord say, Amatablam. I remember very well in 2000 and two before I went to Everest, I, we climbed up to this little ridge and standing in front of me was a beautiful mountain, which I love called Amadablam because of not na naivety, I would say because of my lack of altitude uh, guide telling and things, uh, Amadablam looked like the Everest. And I said, um, I, I can't believe I'll be there next year. And people said, where? I said, up on that mountain. They said, no, <laughs> that's not Everest. That's called Amadablam, which is not even 7,000 meters. So my heart sank. Um, when, I, when I was told that and, and I thought but that's the mountain that I really want to climb because of its beauty so when I was trekking into base camp this year all those memories played back and I reminded myself of that and uh, we got to the Kumjung area near just before you get to the Kumbu Valley where there is Amatablam there is Island Peak there's a mountain called Pokaldi and I reflected on that in like, October 2002 those were the mountains I had climbed, Island Peak and Pokaldi. Island Peak being at about 6,100 meters and Pokaldi about just five, eight, a little bit higher than Kilimanjaro. Those were the two that I used, if I use that word, as training. But for me, I had used them just to be able to be allowed into the team in 2003. So to be able to reflect on those as I was journeying along was quite remarkable. And I, I was able to relive 
every moment of 2003 as I was packing into base camp with my team then, but it was very historic. And I met a lot of, a number of people that um, I would have wanted to meet in my lifetime, one of which, Reinhold Messner, whom I met in uh, first in Namche, and then we were to later meet and sit together in Kathmandu. But 20 years later, it was also this 70th anniversary of Edmund Hillary and Tenzi, Shepard Tenzing no case, enough, 70th no, anniversary. So there were big celebrations there. Yeah, there were big celebrations happening around that as well. And as a result of it, I, I was sitting at a village, which was the 1953 base camp, which you know with Gorek Shep. And then a group of, of trekkers came in and then one person out of interest started talking to us. And then through that discussion, he said, oh, you will see so outside there is Jamling Tenzing Nogai, uh, the son of uh, oh, the oh, first oh, man oh, to oh, summit oh, Everest with um, Hillary. First one, so, so, so that was, I met, I met Jamling and he, he signed my little journal and a very it's humble, wonderful. tiny as Tenzing as well, quite remarkable. So it was a very fulfilling historic journey for me. The, you, two things um, happened in 1953 that were uh, to become world events. One was the fact that um, uh, Sherpa Tenzing or Tenzing Norgay and Sir Edmund climbed um, Everest, and I was born um, in the in June. I think they climbed <laughs> in the July. <laughs> That's amazing. That's amazing. That's amazing. But okay. Also, you know, okay. you, you mentioned now about looking at the wrong mountain. The first time I summited Kilimanjaro, I think it was first, the first night or the second night on the mountain, we were looking at Mount Kenya. And we were also saying, oh, there's the mountain, you know, it doesn't look too bad. And then somebody said, <laughs> look behind you. <laughs> and towering <laughs> above us was Kilimanjaro. You should have gone, all right, I'm going to now worry about this in the morning. <laughs> oh yeah, of course, of course. It, yeah, it, it tends to be the case. Uh, yeah, because I think I think it, my opinion is that we go to this mountain range, but then there's that one mountain that we connect with you, mm. and you 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 tend to really like that mountain. I remember when I was also leading another Kilimanjaro expedition, the one person looked at Mawenzi and said. That mountain is my mountain, and she never yeah. took her eyes away from my Wednesday. And she even planned to return back and climb my Wednesday just purely because my Wednesday spoke to her, to her more yeah. than Kilimanjaro, which she was climbing. <laughs> so I think that is the one thing that we, when we go to all these ranges on the mountains, there's the one that will talk to you. So take us back to this particular trip. Um, you, you painted such a beautiful picture, um, with your words now in what you experienced and and the people that you met. And hopefully you will get to go back maybe next year with your family and, and do the trek again. Is there a point that you can see in the future where you go, all right, been done, now no more. I'll lead up Kilimanjaro because it's an, it's an easier in inverted commas mountain and it's closer and it's less expensive because I should imagine to summit um, Everest now would cost you in excess of a million rand. Um, whereas, well, <laughs> Kilimanjaro, when last I climbed, I think was 44,000 rand or 50,000 rand all in. So they're getting expensive. So what is what is in Sibu Sisu Bolani's future when it comes to mountain climbing? David, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very sad to say that um, sometimes reality sort of kicks in mm. and then you, re you realize that there is a thing called forced retirement. <laughs> if I can <laughs> put it that way. Uh, forced retirement in that your heart will still yearn to do stuff. Your heart will still have the ideas. You will still have the ambition and probably the time to do it. But you will find that there is a resource that is the primary resource that you need to fulfill some of those ambitions and or goals and as such you kind of become content with it and say you know what i think i will take what i've done and appreciated with the life and the time i've been given and then and then you say oh, well that's it for me i will retire but there's nothing at the back of my mind that has pushed me to that as yet it is flickering a little bit it's these lights showing because all attempts 
for me to get back to another bigger mountain have really been they've, they've failed dismally or yeah. totally when i say big mountains to be specific as to what my sort of personal ambitions were apart from the likes of amadablam which is a mountain i love in fact even if i have early retirement that mountain i will make sure that i save myself a little money and i will want to attempt amadablam i will definitely do that i had wanted or hoped to climb at least the highest five of the over 8,000 meter peaks. Uh, to mention those to a person who don't really know, I'm sure now with the likes of uh, um, um, 14 peaks and now this one Norwegian lady who has climbed all 14 of them mm. within three months uh, of the over 8,000 meters peak, people are, are, are watching that and are seeing yeah. it. And and it goes to show what I've always said, you know, once you've got the financial muscle, then you can do those things as quick as possible, as fast as you possibly can, because it's just the time and, and your ambition and then the financial backup. If you have got that, there's nothing can stop you but yourself. So so you, you so the highest five are Everest, um, which I've climbed. There's K2 in Pakistan, which I haven't attempted. There's Kanchen, Kanchenjunga in the Nepalese Himalayas. There's Lhotse and Makalu. These are the top five of the over 8,000 meter peaks. They are not the easiest. They are they are the toughest or hardest or technically difficult. But I never wanted to go for easy. Um, and unfortunately, because they are the highest, they are the cost for each one of them is also very steep. It's quite high. It's a, a statue. I think this will remain a little bit of a fantasy for, for as long as I, I I leave, because I would always have that wish that I if one of them I get a chance to do it, I would do it. But yes, to answer your question now, in 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 summary, I have got um the the ambition, and I'm not stopping yet. I'm not young again, as I should say. I'm not as young um, as I was when I summited Everest twenty years ago. So you kind of look. Physically, you are also deteriorating, and as much as we know that historically the highest, the oldest to summit Everest is 80, so I, I don't think I want to wait until I'm 80 years old to attempt a K2 or something. I want to yeah. do it when I still feel that I'm at my prime of pretty much everything, motivation, time, and physical ability. So God willing and universe willing, if I get an opportunity, I will have one go at another 8,000 meter peak. And if I was to choose which one specifically I would like to go for, I really would like to go to Kanchenjunga. Um, it has a fascination of mine, as much as I'm fascinated by K2 as well. But Kanchenjunga would be my one to go for if the universe just said here is the means to do it. What about your children, Sibu? Do any of them show an interest in climbing? And if so, would you encourage it? Would you take your children up Kilimanjaro with you? Oh, absolutely, yes. I think I think you and I or any other parent out there, you feel very proud if you your children look up to you, whether it is in any career mm -hmm. that you followed and they look at you as an example and say, I would like to be a doctor because my dad was a doctor or in that light. I think you get you get fulfilled as a parent yeah. that in a way or the other you have influenced them in that manner. So yes, uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't mind um helping my children if one of them came to me and said, I want to climb Kilimanjaro, which by by anyways we talk about it. My firstborn daughter, who's thirty years old now, when she was in grade ten, she was mm -hmm. part of these the presidential the presidential scheme awards. Um, okay. And they were much more of like the Duke of Edinburgh. And and then I said to her, if there is anything I can help you with on the adventure side, is taking you up a mountain. And I've got a group that I'm taking up Kilimanjaro this year. If you want to do it, um, I'll, I'll have you in the group. And she said, mm -hmm. oh, absolutely, I'd love to do it. So she had that will and the interest to do it. And she climbed Kilimanjaro with me. It was one of those remarkable moments or experiences. But the one thing that it did for me when I look back and how how she changed from that experience of the mountain towards her career and commitments and hard work, she took one lesson and one lesson only on that mountain was if you want to to end it if you want to do it or to have it you've got to end it you've got to really work hard and Kilimanjaro pushed her and she dug very deep and as such she realized that for me to achieve anything in my life I will have to put in the work and and work very hard 
and then I would succeed. And then from straight from Kilimanjaro, came back home and wrote herself in a law degree. Seven years later, no hassles, no nothing. She's a qualified attorney. And for me, just that was a life-changing moment for her. So yes, and my son as well, he's, he's done a few hikes with me. I'm waiting for the day. But then he, he hear the other thing that I was sharing with another person last week when I was trekking up Kilimanjaro. I said, I was the, I was the, the, the parent who comes from the background of, I will keep quiet. I, I won't say, do that or uh, to dictate what uh, I would say. I will wait until I hear them say, I actually would like to check to Bay Everest Space Camp one day. And then I would say, okay, I will help you. I'll guide you through that. But I never hear. But every time I say to each one of them, um, I have a hike and, and I would like you to join if you if you want and you've got the time. And they've never said no. They've always said, okay, I will do it. So I think the interest is there. It is just because I've not really put them into yeah. and into saying let's do it. But if, if if they had the chance, they would do it. Which is what I like. They have got the spirit and the desire to do these things, which I've done as well. I think they realize that you know what he's set an example. Therefore, we, we might as well follow through. Well, now you have to become an attorney. Well, I don't think I would be inspired by her achievement. I'm happy that she's done that. Um, I've got my own. Um, sort of ambitions on that side of career that I'm pursuing, um, which which again is just to show them that you you, you still have, you must have interest. For me, yeah. the biggest thing is you've got to have an interest, whatever that interest is as a human being and, and as a young person and as, as, a, as a person of my age, because I think life is about having interest. If you don't have interest, then it becomes a little bit, too, too frustrating to live life happily or fulfilled. You want yeah. something that you want, which is of your personal interest. And then once you do that, you're like, no, you know what? I'm, I love what I'm doing and I enjoy what I'm doing. When when you meet people for the first time, if they don't know who you are, let's say it's in a, a social situation. Um, you, you're at a, a party, you're at an event, but you're not the focus of the event, if you get my meaning. And then somebody's introduced to you and they, in the general um, conversation, they go, oh, Sibu Sisu, that's very nice to meet you. You know, what do you do for a living? And you go, I'm a mountain climber. And they go, oh, yeah, right. Uh, you've climbed to Drakensberg probably. And you go, no, I've been up to Everest. And many times up to the top of Kilimanjaro, I'd love to be a fly on the wall when I see their face. When they go, <laughs> oh heck, we've made a big mistake here. <laughs> oh yeah, yes, it it happens all the time, and um, but I don't really take it uh, very serious when that happens. And and you're very correct. Um, it, it's very it it takes a little while for people to to recognize me or to see who's walked into the house because again, it tells me a lesson that. You you are you are not really about what you have achieved as a person. Mm -hmm. You are you as a UI Sibusis, and people will always see you as Sibusis. So up until it gets to that conversation where you mention what you've done, and then oh well, but sometimes they say this is what they say. Oh oh, Sibusis, yes, I know you climbed Kilimanjaro, and I said yes, I've climbed Kilimanjaro, but I've also climbed Everest. It's only then then that they suddenly the jaws drop. Like, oh okay, Everest as well. Well. Well done and all of that, but every time it is surprising to people when you tell them, and then when you go on, when they start realizing who you are, and then they ask you, "Have you climbed this thing called the Seven Summits?" You say, "Of course, I've done the Seven Summits," and they mention a mountain. You say, "Yeah, that one I've done as well," and then they will come to K two and say, "Well, not that one I haven't done yet, but I think one day I might have a go at it." But it it just opens up a very interesting conversation, which I really love. And then I start sharing with people my journeys, how it all started and in, in, in the places that I've seen. So yeah, I love the stories. I love the stories. If, if you had a superpower, if you could be a superhero, what would that superpower be? If, if I had a superpower and a superhero, what would that be? Um, it would just be the power to be able to influence this continent, to make it believe in itself and to make every every African believe that they are unique as Africans and, and, and make every African realize that the only way we can make this continent 
a unique continent is by sharing common goals, having a very common vision uh, for this continent, but with the self-belief that we can do it and that we as a continent are inferior to nobody. We are as equal as anyone. We can achieve as anyone, but we need to have one common goal for our continent. Well said. I, I'm, I'm hoping that people who watch this will take that on and go, yeah, you know, baby steps. If, if we start talking to each other, interacting with each other without anger, without hatred, without fear, because I think that's what the the underlying current is, um, specifically on our continent, is fear from, from all sides. Everybody fears everybody else. Instead of saying, what are our common, what do we have in common rather than what we don't have in common? And once you ta st um, start speaking to people, you realize that you have a lot more that you can talk about than you fight about at the end of the day. Oh, uh, yeah, very agree. I agree 100 uh, percent, David. I think you and I who have traveled um, the world and, and the continent and to mountains in particular, um, where you are at this remote place, that's where you realize that actually we we all are looking towards achieving the same thing. And 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 we have similar interests. And that's where you realize that. Actually, we we are common. We we are human beings uh, living in this space. In our case, this mother 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 Africa mm. um, that we we call it, and and therefore we we all all the lack is in understanding that that is what we lack. That you know, we if we if we don't fear each other, if we just open up to each other, let's talk to each other you will find that we actually want one and the same thing. So it's a question of why don't we then channel all our energies towards helping each other to achieve that. Um, so that's where that's where we have a bit of a challenge. As you, you, you put it nice and correct, like the fear. And we need to overcome that fear. We need to but, overcome that fear. We, should, we shouldn't. We shouldn't yeah. as a continent. I think you should just feel this is our space here and we are going to live and live it in harmony um, as together. But every effort that we're making is just to make this continent a better continent. But I think mountain is a good analogy. Climbing a, a mountain, whatever height it is, you are reliant on the rest of the people in your team. You're also reliant and you have to trust whoever is guiding you to work as a cohesive unit to get to the summit. Because at the end of the day, if you're going to fight along the way, you're not going to make the summit. You're going to come back angry with yourself, with each other. This is why I'm, and I don't know about you, this is maybe just something personal. I don't like it when people say, oh, I conquered Kilimanjaro or I conquered Everest. No, you didn't. The mountain allowed you to climb it. And you're lucky that you returned. You could have died easily on both, but you, you never conquer nature. Nature allows you in and allows you out. And the moment you accept that, that you're not superior to, I think you become a better human being. Absolutely, yes. Um, I, I'm with you. Uh, we, you and I, are very much aligned in that. But I think, I think again, it's a lesson that we we learn um, through through the experiences that we've gone through, because there is a there's a situation, a moment where you look at the events that have happened, and say, um, actually, I wasn't in control here. I wasn't in charge. Um, but I was able to pull through it. And you, if you want to find out the reason why, it's just because you had accepted the fact that you don't matter when you have the mountain does. And this is how I this is how I put it to the people when I'm trying to take them off the mind of I'm going to conquer Kilimanjaro. I'm like, look at it in this light. When you when you leave Kilimanjaro, how high will Kilimanjaro be? Will it be smaller? Will it be taller? It will be exactly the same. It will still be five, eight, nine, five meters. If it's Everest, it's still gonna be eight thousand eight hundred forty-eight meters. But there's a there's a the one one or two one or two things that would have happened to you. You would have become a little bit inferior, or or in, in doubt because you have brought in this um, ego of you're gonna climb the mountain and then the mountain humbles you by making by defeating you because if you don't summit the mountain your confidence goes out the window you come back home feeling down in energy and you're not positive all that is gone so you've lost but if you 
approached the mountain with the humility of the mountain will allow me the time and the opportunity to climb it. And when it does, you become higher than the mountain yeah. personally with growth. You will be much more uh, 6,000 meter giant in you because that mm. is what the mountain has made you through you succeeding with your humility to get to the top. And then when I explain it that way, then they realize that, okay, actually, I conquer my own self. I conquer my own self-doubt, my my own limitations, my my was with. So the things that you conquer when you journey up a mountain. And, yeah. and if you look at it that way, then the mountain will bless you with many summits or allow you the opportunity to climb another one and another one. But as soon as you become a little bit um, arrogant, I've seen people uh, to say, I'm going to run up this mountain. And the next time I see them in this very appalling sight being carried in a little basket by a tiny yeah. porter or shepherd. Yeah. Like, what were you doing? Mountains are, have got energy, but if you, we allow them the space, they just give us a lot of positive energy. It's, it's the same, you know, comrades has just happened here in South Africa. Those of us who have run it, and I know you like me have, and people whinge about places like Polly Shorts, Harrison Flats, Fields Hill, those those hills will be there once you've run past, as you say with a mountain. That hill's going nowhere, um, so you may yeah. as well just accept it. Either walk it, crawl it, or run it, whatever you're capable of doing. But when you get to the top or the bottom, just say thank you for allowing it to to let you continue, and and that's what it's all about, you know. Absolutely, um, in pretty much in pretty much everything. When it's a, when it's about a physical challenge, um, I again training people. I say to them, don't even think about the mountain. You know the mountain, or you know it's a comrade. You can't do nothing about that. You will never change the distance. Well, they can play around saying it's it's eighty nine point whatever or it's yeah. ninety point whatever, but it will always once that has been decided. Added, it's gonna be like it's gonna be that. So there's no reason for you sort of really uh, focusing on your energy towards. Ah, oh, it's going to be ninety kilometers. Just focus on you. Focus mm -hmm. on you. How am I going to deal with the likes of poly shorts in those yeah. mountains? And 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 then and then you work your your body towards being able to achieve that, and your mental uh, toughness towards able to um able to to get you across the finish line. And and once you do that then you're on your way to finishing a comrade or summiting a mountain. But when you focus on the mountain, you will, first of all, you will not sign up. You won't go yeah. because you will think about the cold, you think about the, the altitude, the physical torment of it, then it puts you off the idea and then you walk away. You focus the wrong, the wrong, on the wrong yeah. thing, which you can never really influence. You can never influence. You can't change it. The only thing you can do is to focus on you and you can only influence yourself. Once you realize that, that's it. You've learned the greatest of lessons in life. Sibyl, if what would you like to tell people about yourself that we might not already know about you? <laughs> oh, I don't. I don't really know. Eh? Um, what what is it that people don't really know about me? Um, let me think this quite quickly. It's it. I've, because I've shared with people quite a lot about me. We, yeah, well, there, there are a few things that people don't know about me, particularly to people that have only known me now that this is the Bustiso Villani, Mount Everest Summit here. I never started like that. Um, I started very poor. Uh, I started uh, with my parents separating when I was about two years old. And, and that meant that the first 10 years of my life were really desperate. Uh, my sister and I had no had no food. Um, we never enjoyed three meals a day. I never wore a pair of shoes until I was I was age ten, which were the shoes that I was afforded by my stepdad to as a school uniform. And I was a little head boy helping people because they'd come to my grandmother and said, "Can we help? Can we help him work for us? Because you know he's not at school." Um, it was claimed to be a paying job. I was seven years old. I think that's probably the time I started working and I've been working ever since until today. So I started in, in that background and and because I had never had a home uh, and, and my mother could not afford to put my, me and my kids at school. I only started grade one. I never went to preschool. 
I went straight to grade one at the age of 10. And then I walked out of uh, metric and went into a, into a working environment. So that's the other thing that people want to know. They would think I went to college, university. No, I couldn't afford all of that. So I'm just um, an ordinary um, high school, uh, not, I wouldn't say drop out, a high school achiever. And I've taken that and made it uh, work for me and for my life. Uh, so. I think I think that is wonderful. I really and truly do. Um, we're coming to the end of our time again. Um, I hate having to say goodbye to you. I really and truly do. And it seems as once again, once again uh, Sibu is frozen at the very last moment. Oh, no, Eva. we're back. Yay. Um, I just Eva. want to say, Sibu, Sibu, thank you so very much for chatting to me. It's always a pleasure and in fact it's more than a pleasure it's an inspiration to talk to you because I will now go into my day and and, and try and look for all the positives if I can't find a parking space near the shop I want to go to I will park a little further and I will walk and I will think of you climbing Everest while I, while I walk to wherever I'm going. David you are so very kind and thank you very much for the to the people that listen uh, to you to your, um, your, your your podcast or recording I hope they enjoy it. I hope they get the inspiration that we you are all getting. But here's a point. We all inspire each other. That's why we need to share this story. That's why I really enjoy what you are doing, because it's when I hear someone else's story that I feel encouraged and motivated to just keep on going, because we're here to live and we need to enjoy uh, this life that we are given during this space or this lifetime that we have. We can't live any, any for 100 years. We, no, we, uh, we just need to make sure that Every day, you make it a great day for yourself. Thank you so much. My guest today on In Conversation with Once Again has been the incredible Sibusi Suvalani. And as you've heard, his story started from very humble beginnings and now has stood with very few at the very top of the highest peak in the entire universe. Sibs, thanks so much for chatting with me. Um, I look forward to your next summit attempt. So we... Well, we'll find something to talk about again because I, I really enjoy having you on the show with me.